I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Well, I always enjoy talking about public health, and who better to talk to about public health than a professor of public health? And whenever I want to talk to a professor of public health, I'm in an extremely fortunate position to be able to connect with Grant Schofield, who is a professor of public health in in Auckland, in New Zealand, and uh, we catch up regularly, like I do with some of my other guests, and uh, this was an opportunity to catch up and talk about how our current state of health is, how we would approach improving health. Um, It's always interesting to get a perspective on the pandemic and a whole range of other issues. So I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Professor Grant Schofield. Welcome, Grant. Hi, Rod. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Grant. I always enjoy talking to you. Listen, you know, medical science, medicine, health, we're all, you know, 21st century stuff. As we take a step back from all this, are we healthier than our grandparents as, a, as you're in your position of Professor of Public Health? Well, I think it depends on how you measure health. Uh, you know, just being alive is often a pretty good way of measuring it. So yeah, that, on that measure, actually we are. And, you know, really, I think we forget the progress that we've made in the last 100 or so years because life expectancy, you know, more or less doubled. And so, okay, that wasn't maybe our grandparents, maybe that was our great grandparents, but yeah, we're, we're, we're doing better in that respect. Okay, well, you know, what happened, we've made quite a lot of medical advances, especially in, in injuries, uh, some illnesses like cancer, uh, we can treat better. We certainly have taken a lot of environmental things that turned out to be quite bad out of the environment, like on a lead and petrol, asbestos, uh, these, you know, so, yeah, which in my case is used for kids' Christmas decorations, you know, so it's, we've, we've done so much better on that, so that's great. Mm. But um, the second sort of counter to that as well, you know, when we're alive, especially in the last 30 years, has our quality of life kept up with that improvement in our quantity of life? It's that public health term is morbidity. And the answer is like, no, we haven't. Actually, we've now got this quite long period, the longest in human history, we're alive, but our quality of life is impaired because of poor health. And I think for in Australia and New Zealand, that's running at about 12 to 13 years of life loss, loss to disability due to poor health. And for the average, it's about a third of that is requiring one-on-one care. And I don't think oh. anyone, no one really aspires to that, do they? No. Uh, no, so no. I suppose... I don't know if it's an assumption, but I've imagined, you know, just even from clinical work and talking to people and research over the years that, you know, when you talk to people about their lives, I can't, I can't remember anyone who didn't have in their top three being healthy for, for the whole time they were alive. So <laughs> that's, we haven't really kept pace with that. One of the things about um, life expectancy, which is often put out there as a major improvement, Um, comes down to, in the calculations, I guess, two or three things. One is childhood morbidity has gone down, which which would lower the average dramatically right there, wouldn't it? I mean, if someone was dying in the first five years of life, that would have a significant impact on average. Yeah, and I think Australia's an example of the inequalities in that. So, I mean, we've reduced it to, you know, virtually nothing in Australia kids dying young, but then you look across Aboriginal populations and you're, you're just like, wow, man, that's astonishing. That still happens in, a, in, in the real world, in the developed world. So, yeah, I think pretty much, but pretty much across most of developed society, we've got that way down. So what's our current, what are the major health challenges in today's world? Well, it's, it's, it's non-communicable disease, isn't it? Chronic disease is the other word for that. And what do we count off those big four or five things? Cancer, diabetes cardiovascular disease and stroke, Alzheimer's and dementia and other neurological issues, uh, mental health, including depression and then through to suicide. Uh, yeah, those, those are metabolic diseases, at least in part, and in all for some of them. Uh, they clustered, they're related, and you know, that's what's going to get virtually all of us. So, and it's an interesting thing that, to me, what's been really interesting to me, we've had this whole 
COVID pandemic for the last few years. And yeah, it's a new virus and it'll kill some people and all that sort of stuff. But it's burden compared to to these metabolic diseases is, is so small compared to the large thing of that. And I think the unfortunate thing is it's just that discussion has just fallen off the cliff. I, I've hardly done any mainstream media discussion around diet, activity, fitness, uh, thinking hot and cold, breathing, all the things that I'm interested in, sleep from a, an academic and scientific and practice point of view. No one's interested anymore, in the, at least in mainstream, in the last couple of years. I, I find that astonishing, to be perfectly honest. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I kind of, when this pandemic started, thought, wow, what an incredible opportunity this is. We have got a global population reflecting on comorbidities, mm. the new word for them, but we norm, normally refer to as chronic diseases, which you've yeah, just yeah. mentioned. What an opportunity to focus on reducing your risk. And, and here you are, Professor of Public Health, not unlike in Australia. I would have thought they would have been front and centre. Hey, folks, red flags here. Not yeah, we having... tried quite early on with that. I was like, man, this is an opportunity when it became obvious that something like uncontrolled blood sugar or high insulin, uh, inflammation, uh, low vitamin D, uh, recently more less, things like high lactate in the blood were really the primary risk factors for uh, poorly out of this. Uh, that would be really the discussion. I tried to write early on with that. Uh, another professor here, uh, nutritional psychology, Julia Rutledge, and I wrote a couple of papers together. I've and, spoken to Julia and yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, she's a complete legend. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, those were basically just you know, completely off into the ether, never to be seen again, hardly read by anyone and had absolutely no public policy impact at all. And, you know, like you know, one of the mantras of public health, everyone's sort of overly optimistic. Oh, yes, we can solve this. We can solve that. I'm just going, oh, now now with metabolic health, I'm just going, oh, I don't know. Society sort of lost interest in it. What, what I mean, what are they? I, I just don't get that. I just don't understand is it because we've been so distracted by the media? Is that part of what it is? Yeah, I don't know. With that, I, I, I suppose I've been thinking more about it. Like, well, you know, you sort of catch a disease, a contagious disease, which you know basically wasn't really your fault. You know, everyone was. If something bad happens to you, it could happen quite quickly. It seems sort of scary and out of your control. A bit like getting eaten by a shark. Something you want to avoid at all costs. Uh, where. Whereas chronic disease is sort of oh, within your control. It's chronic, that's the whole point of it, it takes ages, it's silent. I don't know, so maybe that's the difference as humans, we, we, we value that acute issue and mm. prioritise that way more than this chronic issue. I don't it's, have any answer, I don't know what you think about that. But. Well, I kind of wonder whether, um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a sad reflection on how we manage chronic disease because uh, you can appear to do a good job hiding behind the long timelines of a yeah. chronic disease. You know, you can be an expert, give people anti-cholesterol drugs and treat <laughs> their cardiovascular disease or give them antidepressants and treat their depression and it'll go on for years and years and years. And uh, using that kind of model yeah. for treating this this pandemic, I just I just think... But, but it's been also interesting from a work perspective, hasn't it? Because, you know, we spend a third of our lives working and, and that's changed a lot in the, in the last 50 years. What do you think the, the impact of, uh, of the way we work has had on our health? I think well, you're sort of talking about the fact that in, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century in Australia and New Zealand, I think between 2 and 4% of people, uh, no, now 2 to 4% of people are working on the land physically. Yeah. Um, back then it was 70 or 80%. So we've had this massive reduction, right? Like in just a short period of time, so of involved in anything that involves actual uh, physical effort yeah. has just gone away, which is an interesting thing. And you know, here we are sitting around the whole day and you know, equally equally at risk. So you know, the hypocrisy is not lost. But yeah, I've, I've always talked about exercise as a sort of purposeful activity, as a post-World War II concept. Really, there was, you know, for the most part, humans were wanting to have a rest because of their, you know, physically strenuous life. And that's just a distant memory. It's, you know, in a couple of generations, we just forget that even happened. Right? You, you mentioned a few things very quickly in passing about what you consider would reverse those trends. And you've mentioned exercise as one. And, and I guess, well, why don't we just dive into that uh, firstly? Because I think one of the challenges for us now is, I guess, 
building it into our lives. Yeah, yeah. So I've been studying this my whole career, really, and thinking a lot about how you communicate this, what it means with, I, I like to talk about this fitness as medicine, but the, the whole field of physical activity and health that really started with, uh, yeah, that, that, that matched peers design that happened by accident with the London bus drivers, that the, the epidemiologist Jerry Morris started studying in the 50s and 60s. So, you know, men came in and some were conductors and some were, were who walked around and checked tickets and whatnot, so they had an active job, and some were drivers who, who were sedentary and sat there. And he, he noted that I think they were twice the risk of uh, acute myocardial infarction, stroke, and you know, uh, early death and all that sort of stuff. So that was the, the beginning of this epidemiology of physical activity and health. And, and that, yeah, there was all sorts of similar types of studies. And then, you know, you can show experimentally that you can get people fitter and have a better thing on their health. The thing is, what do you do with that information? How do you communicate? Because there's really two levels here. There, there's, do you tell people the minimum effective dose? So, okay, you're a complete couch potato. If you accumulate half an hour of anything a day, do it in 10 minute bouts, even gardening will get you there. Um, well, we know that if you move from being sedentary, that that, that that has a positive effect, but it is the minimum effective dose. And you've got this sort of dose response up to that, right? Where every extra bit of stuff you do, and then you get into the more complex domains. I do zone two training, I do strength training. I, I've just, my wife's talked to me to doing one of these 15 minutes a day flexibility programs. Oh, yeah, I've only done one day. Uh, <laughs> But then, then there's all these extra benefits that, that have been had, and you've got the sort of optimization, and then you've got the complexity of where you're at, the age you're at, and that sort of stuff. So, how, how you communicate fitness as medicine in a coherent public way is a really interesting question that I, I still don't know the answer to. And I think we've, we've gone for setting the bar as low as we possibly can and hope that the worst people jump up there. But I don't know, is there, a, is there ethics in medicine that says maybe you should uh, tell people the the whole range of benefits and where they start and stop, or is that too complex? These are just unanswered questions in public health. Do you, I found one of the most uh, liberating bits of information, and I think it came from Michael Mosley. He did a, a program on it, and he said uh, if you do uh, three minutes or five minutes of high-intensity intermittent training, your metabolism is up for 24 to 48 hours. If you went for a 10-kilometre run, it would be up for six or eight hours. Is that your understanding of, you know, less is more? I thought that was liberating. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, I, I think yeah, that's definitely true. We've done our own research with the HIT, the high intensity training. And, you know, it's true that very brief doses have a profound physiological effect. But it's just, there's more complexity than that, right? Because, well, first of all, there's, the, there's all these dimensions of fitness that, interact so you know it's good having that sort of cardiovascular and some muscular fitness there but then there's more resistance trained strength stuff that's independently good for you uh, especially as you age and lose muscle mass there's functional mobility that doesn't concentrate on that and then there's there's actually a profound difference between you know almost antagonistically between that low intensity zone two training which you can accumulate a lot of volume for it, it, it it brings lactate down, it stimulates, it brings glucose and insulin down, it stimulates fat burning, and it, and it has a profound effect on mitochondrial efficiency. And that, that's not a, no small thing. And you don't get mm. that from that high intensity. Uh, it's profoundly anti-inflammatory. And those are all good things in that dose. The, 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 it's interesting that the high intensity has the, virtually the opposite, it drives lactate way up acutely. You can even get gluconeogenesis, so glucose comes up you get a profoundly inflammatory environment and the acute effect of that inflammation is very, very good. So, so you know, both, all of those dimensions, but particularly the difference between aerobic and, and high intensity anaerobic uh, exercise, you know, one's not better than the other, they're just different, just totally different, right? So uh, that, that's what we struggle with because it, there's complexity to it and there's a dose response, and you just tell people, I oh, just do anything because you're all doing nothing anyway, and that'll be better. Yeah, oh, maybe. Or do you tell them the, how do you communicate simply the, the more complex benefits and you know optimize your health? Well, you probably want a little a bit more than just going for a, a walk. Hmm. Although walking, I mean, I, there was a you, it's interesting you mentioned that bus drivers or bus service, the conductor bus driver, which I hadn't heard of, but makes so much sense and doesn't appear to be 
very much different in terms of intense intensity other than one moves and one doesn't. Yeah, just as part of their normal day. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which which there was an there's out of the UK I think there was a whole thing about walking speed as a predictor of five year longevity. Yeah, I, I mean that's actually quite a good thing. You can give people these twelve minute walk tests and all these sorts of things and and yeah the faster they go the longer they live. But I think it you know it correlates with cardiorespiratory fitness in general, yeah, like you want to better move. I mean, humans are living animals. Uh, living animals, you know, generally have been selected for if they could still function as they age. So, um, yeah. And your wife's got you onto flexibility, uh, which I think, apart from strength and cardiovascular um, strength and cardiovascular uh, fitness, yeah. flexibility as we get a bit older is pretty important too. Yeah, I, to be honest, it's something I've neglected. I've been an endurance athlete my whole life, and it's something I really enjoy. Um, in recent years, I've started going and doing more resistance training. I'm you know, 54, so uh, I think I've benefited from that. But I, my range and functionality of movement compared to those people around me, I suck. And, hmm. and so, I, yeah, I do acknowledge I need to do some more work on that. And uh, I look you know, forward a generation to my dad and he'd never done any of that stuff. And yeah, I think that's what's got him in the end is lack of functional. Yes, and it's interesting, isn't it, that that functional movement which kind of is that everyday twisting, turning, bending, stretching, pushing, pulling, mm. as opposed to your long distance endurance thing, yeah. which, which is very repetitive, yeah. but it's also very meditative too, isn't it? There's an aspect to that long distance running, which is more than just physical, isn't it? Oh, I, I love that stuff for that exact reason. It's how I think of things. I can just be daydreaming, but not in a ruminative way, in a positive way. And that sort of thing. Uh, on the functional movement side, though, you're right. We need that as well. I've been a big fan of uh, Peter Atiyah's view of the centenarian Olympics, and he's like, well, if you've got to work to lift to 100, what are the sort of things you might want to do to be functional? You know, lift a suitcase above your head because you sort of go on a flight. Uh, squat down and catch a five-year-old, a great grandkid, as they're sprinting towards you and lift them up. Yeah. Uh, and these types of activities. Now, let's work backwards. Well, what do you want to be doing when you're 70 to manage that? That's had quite an effect on my thinking just even about myself, right? I don't know about you. You're oh, away there. Yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I mean, I've mean, i got grandchildren aged from, uh, I've got five now, uh, four, one, one a week away. Uh, yeah. but, the, but the four and the, uh, and actually the two, the four and the six-year-old do run in and, and I have to kneel down, you know, squat down, and if they run at me too fast, I've got to brace myself for it. You know? <laughs> but but it's true. I mean, and I want to be I want to be able to get down there and do it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and how cool will that be if you get to do the same to their kids? Yes. Wow. What a treat! What a what treat! A treat. Yeah. I think another one was the resting squat, uh, which is an interesting flexibility. Uh, exercise do you, do you do you think what do you think of the resting squat? oh this is just sort of asian yep. type. yeah i've been doing some of those this morning actually um again i suck at them but uh yeah i feel that's a really good range of movement through that hip seductor area i actually been working quite hard on that recently i, I actually don't suck as much as i do on everything else out there because i've been working at that I, I find that really good actually mm. i mean part of what we focus on too is postural stresses and uh, one of those is toilet position you yep. know, because we are, we are, we have evolved to be in that squat position, mm. and and uh, it makes a huge difference. So mm. being able to do that, not just to grab your grandkids, but to uh, facilitate a full <laughs> bowel movement. Yeah, well, well that's you right. Know. You did right. Yeah, yeah. But listen, um, the other one you I know are pretty passionate about is not just exercise, but nutrition. Um, and mm. and when you are as a professor again a professor of public health and I know your view on nutrition to some degree Grant I think I do you must look at public health messages sometimes or the food pyramid or the Australian healthy eating guidelines what do you think of as a professor of public health when you read things like that yeah it's really frustrating I think we, I sort of felt that with evidence things would change over the time but you know in actual fact I think your yeah, mistakes were made for sure. So, you know, some of those, I don't know if they were conspiratorial or, or, or just you got the wrong hypothesis. It's, you know, it's plausible that because fat's got twice as many calories for the same amount of weight as, as carbohydrate and protein, that energy density could affect eating and obesity and health and all that sort of stuff. 
it's, it's plausible that eating fat could turn out to be fat in your blood and therefore accumulate as fat in your in your blood vessels, especially the coronary artery and the brain and that sort of thing. Um, so I suppose those were hypotheses that were worthwhile exploring. They just didn't ever turn out to be true. And then they just made it through battles of will into public health guidelines before that was really settled. And the food industry got involved and, and we haven't really been able to weed them out. And I had felt that we would make good progress. And I, I suppose we have in a way, I think people understand that fat's no longer the sort of demonised the way it was, but you know, many of the public pressures, this is the Eat Lancet guidelines and all this sort of stuff, where they sort of switched tack and gone, oh, it's the planet now, your meat was also bad for you, and now it's bad for you because it's ruining the planet. I'm not really an expert in regenerative agriculture, but maybe, you know, we could do better there. So I just sort of frustrated. We've been doing some studies recently. One of my master students has been going to primary schools and taking photos of school lunch boxes. Mm-hmm. And then we... We've invented this classification system. I've called it the HIS, the Human Interference Scoring System. And so I was just an attempt to try and go, okay, what's the percentage of whole food in what you're eating and what's the percentage of ultra-processed food? And so we've just tried to get some guidelines. And it, you know, it has, it's not, not a perfect system, but I think it moves away from just concentrating on nutrients in general to the level of processing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I felt that might be a way to... Yeah, kids can understand it, parents can understand it, and you, you, if we could get to a set of guidelines that have avoided plant versus meat, avoided carbs versus no carbs, avoided uh, all sorts of dogmas around nutrition, and I think the one thing that everyone agrees on is that we're shoveling down a lot of ultra-processed food, and no one's going, those Doritos are a health food. Uh, so, not so far as I know anyway, maybe there's a Dorito diet, didn't you? Uh, I'm sure there will be. <laughs> uh, but, and so th- I think I'm going to start advocating much more for, first of all, understanding the, the amount of ultra processed people eat, food eat, people eat. And in the second, that is a target for reducing and, and seeing what we can do for health there and seeing if that's more understandable. And yeah, the, then, then you get the next level that becomes political people going, well, the poorer people can't afford unprocessed food so they you know you discriminate against them and it's like well yeah there's problems with our food supply for sure but we'll not start with the best and and what were your findings there you know like what percentage of the children's lunch boxes were processed or ultra processed also ultra ultra processed was running about 75 to 80 percent i mean whatever you think this is a lower decile schools which is you know poorer whatever you think ron about what kids' lunch boxes look like in Australia and New Zealand. I think you'll find it's worse than you think. And I think, you know, there's, there's so many, even when you go to high decile ones, you see things like, oh, you know, veggie crisps, you know, made with real vegetables. And you look on the back and it's like a one or 2% um, some ridiculous vegetable extract. You know, it's 98% ultra processed rubbish. Mm. And, you know, that, you just change the brand and, and, and the health halo, the richer you get. And, and honestly, I mean, yeah, parents still put in apples and, and oranges and bananas and these sorts of things, but whole food, is, as we would understand, it's pretty rare. Uh, oh, and, wow. and you can under, understand why parents do this in a rush. They're, they're trying to get off to do things. And, uh, you know, the kids prefer that ultra-processed food. Of course they do. Hmm. Uh, but, yeah, so we've got a long way to go on that. I, I think actually it's interesting to look at uh, this uh, vegan movement and the demonization of, of, of meat, which you alluded to, and this new term, which I think will be to the 21st century what ultra-processed food was to the 20th century, and that is plant-based meats. Oh, my goodness, yes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's ultra-processed food. It doesn't meet the basic <laughs> definition of food. You're an environmental. You're an environmental warrior, though. If you are eating plant-based meat, I don't believe that. It's like biofuels. Like you, you farm the corn with, with diesel and petrol and all this sort of stuff. You grow the corn. You take it, drive it to the processing plant, and eventually you just extract fuel out of it. And you burn the fuel, and it's slightly cleaner. Honestly, really, that's what it comes down to. I, I feel that's in the same category. Uh, can can we farm? animals better around the world well i i imagine we can you look at some of these feedlot type situations in the mid west of the us and it it makes you sick frankly Hmm. Um, and yeah there is 
questions about how we feed sustainably and whatever our population. I, the main problem I have with the meat that I buy sometimes, it comes in these stupid plastic containers that are going to last about 4,000 years before anything happens to them. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're not even recyclable. Yes, I, I find the same frustration. In fact, uh, we try, I'm trying now to go to the butcher with our own containers. And that's my next, uh, you know, give them the container and say, give me a pound of, you know, give me a, a kilo of whatever and just put it in, put it yeah, in this container. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, it'd be good because there's a whole, con- there's a, a special issue, I forget the journal, but around endocrinology. Rob Lustig read a, read a three-part series on obesity that came out of just a little while back. And this paper two was around additives and then bisphenols and even the stuff that you contain food in. And uh, I, I'd always had my students for the last several years going on to me about that. And I was like, oh, I don't reckon the evidence is there. Probably, how do you even do that epidemiology? Um, you know, I'm sure glycophosphates aren't good for you. But how would you even know as everyone gets it? Uh, but actually, that, that review paper really does a, a super, super job of understanding that. And I'd actually say the level of evidence for this, the whole range of different things that get into our food supply, but especially like the bisphenols and these sorts of things, the BPA, is is actually really strong. And so, you, right, could you take your own containers? Could you get the food and those things? That would be a cool world. Uh, probably a ways off that world, right? Yeah, but that is just from the packaging of the meat itself. Yeah, well, I mean, from the, the vacuum, the plastic, the plastic just gets into the food supply, and it's the soft plastics everywhere. You get your nuts and soft plastics. You get your uh, or everything. I, yeah, I mean, we're, our, my family tries hard. We're reasonably well off, but we're terrible. The massive rubbish uh, thing going out every week. Oh, this makes me sick. Hmm. Well, I don't even. Where, where does it go? What, what happens to this? When's it? Yeah, we sort of you know put the hands over the ears there and just go no no nothing to see here. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, the last two years have uh, have thrown up some challenges uh, for, from us. What, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? That, how do you how have you seen those last two these last two years of pandemic and? and well, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I've been astonished. I I don't trust the mainstream media anymore, frankly. Like I I go to it. And I read stuff, especially around COVID, and go, that's just not true. Um, I mean, it, it, we have a particularly interesting thing here. I don't know what they do in Australia, but but here, if you've had COVID in the last 28 days and you die, it's a COVID death. I mean, we have homicides, for God's sake, that are COVID deaths. Uh, uh, what I would really want, what I really want to know about the burden of COVID is if, if you died from it with no other obvious cause of death, uh, if you had a cobalt, but you can categorise people or it's actually just you died with it and that was the end of it. Like, I think that's a fair thing to know in the case of a public health epidemic. And then on the other side of that, with the vaccine harm, we don't, I have no idea what that is because we don't collect it in anywhere the same way. We have reported deaths and eventually, you know, one or two here have been upheld by the coroner and said, yeah, there was no other reason that could have happened. So we've got this gross mismatch between understanding harm and benefit. And I think it's in the public interest to be able to understand whatever those numbers are, which, by the way, I have really no clear idea what those numbers are. And then and then anything that affects public health, I, I reckon then there's the harm versus benefit thing is like a big discussion. Like, so the way I've thought about it in New Zealand, I, I don't know, if, if we had done not much in terms of restriction, then perhaps we might have had 8% excess deaths from our normal mortality uh, over the, that period of time, that's about midway through the European stuff. So, so that, mm. that maybe that was a reasonable assumption. You know, with, you know, I don't know if that's true, going to be true or not. But say it did turn out to be that. Um, you know, remember, New Zealand's a smaller country than Australia. We've got five million people, thirty-eight thousand people die a year, so that's about three thousand excess deaths. Um, we've spent an extra sixty billion dollars over that period on this COVID thing, and so if that's if we've saved all of those lives and they wouldn't have died anyway. Um, that's about $20 million per life saved, you know, which in public health sense is, is just ridiculous. Hmm. Like it's not close. Like we, we actually quantify that in public health. You go, well, you know, in New Zealand, Australia, we're prepared to pay about thirty-five dollars to $55,000 uh, a year for a life, for that life being saved. And hmm. that's about where the metric is. And that, that's a very wealthy country that can afford to do that, that level of investment. Compared to, uh, compared to $20 million. Well, <laughs> makes no sense at all. Uh, yeah. And in the meantime, we've probably had other harms over and above that, which we you know, haven't really quantified. We've, you know, here we've had our ambulance services 
um, they called out another 30% of times, almost all of those uh, acute mental health call outs. Um, so, you know, there's that burden that's emerging and you know, other things. So I, I found it incredibly frustrating, the, the lack of scientific debate and that sort of thing. You know, any contrary opinion you label a conspiracy theorist is, is a little bit disconcerting um, when you regard yourself as a serious scientist, you know, it's like, so yeah, in the end, I've probably just disengaged. You, you shouldn't have got me talking about this. I've, I've tried to disengage from it completely because it's bad for my own mental health. Yes, no, I <laughs> so, totally, I totally, I, 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 re I agree with you. I mean, yeah. I've stopped uh, looking at the news two, yeah. two or three years ago because, and I've stopped referring to news outlets previously yeah. referred to as news outlets. <laughs> I refer to them now as I refer to them now as media outlets. Yeah. Things like the Guardian, the Sydney Morning Herald. Mm -hmm. You know, these are just media outlets as far as I'm concerned. And and I agree with you. I think for our own mental health, it's better to disengage. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, well, like like you, Granders. I mean, you're and you're you know in your position as a public health. You would have been frustrated by the influence of industry. This isn't a conspiracy theory, by the way. This is just a business model. Hmm. Okay, you would have been frustrated by by the influence of industry on public health, but you must have been shocked by the last two years. You'd have been yeah, aware yeah, of it because we knew about you know Nestle and Coca Cola, and we knew about uh, yeah the car industry. Yeah, you know, the, the car industry in the US was, this is the conspiracy theory, they were convicted uh, of conspiracy, a, a cartel of Chevron Oil, uh, Firestone and the Ford Motor Company to, you know, buy and scuttle innocent rail networks in virtually every major US city. Like, it's not a conspiracy theory. They did it, got people in cars, inactive and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So we weren't surprised by that. But, yeah, the, this, uh, this drug company starts next level. Oh, yeah. I, what has also surprised me is how many people have unwittingly uh, volunteered to support an industry that's repeatedly been found guilty of fraud. <laughs> oh, well, that's right. Yes, so they are as well, aren't they? So, well, I think ordinary ordinary citizens have become marketing and compliance officers for an industry guilty yeah. of fraud time and time again. I just, yeah. I just don't Sorry. get it. I mean, I think it's a testament to media media outlets that they've mm. seconded these people. Grant, if you were going to leave us with, uh, you know, like here's a message from a public health, you know, professor on how we should improve our health, if you had to kind of give us, and I know you've already kind of outlined this, but leave us with three or four things that you feel are keys to improving health. Um, the, the first one's a sort of slightly off one because it's not it's not a personal one, but you do get to vote for it. I know you guys are doing that at the moment. Yep. Is that... Public health is, is, should not be a political football that bounces left to right. And, and left comes in and goes, oh, it's no one's fault. We're going to fund these public health programs, which spend a lot of money and do nothing. And then the right comes and goes, oh, that was all bullshit. Everyone should just decide for themselves. We're not funding anything. Surely there's some middle ground where we actually fund evidence-based decent programs, and that's a consistent line in the health budget. Can you imagine if they go, oh, no, broken legs, you're, you just do that at home. And, <laughs> you know, like... It wouldn't be a thing. So, so I think that's like our basic health, which requires us to behave in certain ways, which we'll get to in a sec, requires government funding and input. And how that's become a political football that it's either all over to you or we're going to pay for the whole lot, but not actually do it properly is seems ridiculous to me. So that's the first thing. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing, personal tools. I, like I'm just a big fan of, of as you know, uh, moving and with the understanding the complexity of those dimensions. Uh, eating whole food, uh, especially then to keep the, the carbs and sugar down if you're insulin resistant. Uh, getting a good night's sleep. I, I've really become a big fan of the idea of that sort of lost focus that, that people open their phones about 150 times a day and, and spend these micro times on it, many of the things they don't even know they're doing. You're, you find yourself opening the bloody thing before you even know... <laughs> <laughs> You've done it for goodness sake, uh, and so so there's that aspect. Uh, and then I've become really interested in in, in hot and cold recently, oh, and yeah. using cold water uh, with some breath, and then using sauna. I, I've you know I know these aren't always accessible, but you know a hot bath does the same thing as a sauna. Uh, and in fact, it probably is a bit more heat stress or really hot because it's you're in liquid, not air. Um, those things are profoundly useful. And, and, and the last thing I've got 
the my thing I've got most interested in recently is that sort of third wave of behavioral therapy called acceptance commitment therapy or ACT. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been loving that stuff. Uh, and, and it's nothing new. It's all the stuff that the Stoics had done, the Buddhists have done for, for a century, the Japanese psychologist has been doing, you know, 2,000 years ago of, of just accepting that, that negative thoughts and ups and downs are, you know, just are intrinsic to the human experience and trying to do what CBT said, which is not get them in the first place. It's absolutely futile. And so, you know, if anyone sort of looking for that next little step personally, it's really helped me. It's helped me with my kids. It's helped me with coaching that I do, both health coaching and performance coaching. Uh, it's just helped in all sorts of aspects is to learn a bit more about acceptance commitment therapy. And it sounds like it's some wacko uh, Freudian nut job psychotherapy, but it's the, like the exact opposite of that, like useful tools. Go, go and look that one up. Mm. Yeah, just wow. Just, uh, because I guess uh, one of the things we – we talk about emotional stress and think, well, you might not be able to change the world you live in or the people that you come into contact with, but you can change your attitude to it. And I'm guessing that the acceptance and commitment therapy is a great tool for doing just that. Yeah, yeah, negative thoughts come in and you just notice them, like a dog. Yeah. It's, it's in your house somewhere. I don't know where he is, but he's there. Uh, sometimes at the front barking, but, you know, engaging with him, it's just going to make him more involved. If you, if you don't want to talk to the dog, so yeah. And you and you mentioned that hot and cold because one of the questions I'm often asked is, is is all stress bad? Yeah, well, that's is a great example, isn't it? So you're getting you're actually stressing the body with the cold and the shiver response to to you know to brown or at least beige the white fat that's metabolically great. You you remove glutamate in the brain that's great. There's irazine, which is a myokine, which is you know, responsible for and, uh, muscular work is enhanced, and then you get that those uh, heat shock proteins and the cellular resilience from the from the hot. You know, these these are stresses, but in small doses. Obviously, you stay in cold water for long enough, it's going to kill you. And same with saunas. So these are, I guess, in that Wim Hof thing. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But you know, these are these are small doses. Hmm. Hmm. Fasting is another intentional stress in a way, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So that bangs it up. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been thinking, I've obviously written books on fasting, and I think a lot about fasting. I think for men, it's pretty good. I think postmenopausal woman, it's pretty good. I, I just, you know, if, you, if you're a woman, 10% you know, of women suffer from PCOS, you know, and one of those root causes is high cortisol. You know, if you're prone to high cortisol already, then, you know, maybe fasting's not for you. But, you know, if you just want to eat less and, and you know, calm the nervous system and brain and return everything to normal and, then it, it can work as a powerful tool. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of fasting for me, but I know it doesn't work for everyone. How, how do you incorporate it into your life? Well, I, I mean, ideally you miss dinner and have breakfast, but um, that's, there's no way that's going to work for me. So I, I just have a couple of days a week where I miss breakfast and have a, uh, a late lunch. And then when I do eat, that uh, it's generally trying to keep it pretty low carb and whole food. And then once or twice a year, my wife and I set aside some time and do, you know, we aim for a sort of a two to three day fast. And then maybe if it's going really well, I might extend it up to four to five. I usually pull the pin, I don't know, day three or four. I, I, for me, I start to lose sleep quality at that point and it doesn't seem worthwhile. But, it, you know, I try, try to do that once a year. And yeah. And, and, and during that time is just with this having water. Oh, yeah, I have black coffee. I just, this, I, I'm just not up to getting off the coffee. <laughs> other people might be, but I, you know. This is about, this is, uh, that's the other thing, uh, Grant, is, uh, you know, I kind of think of it, uh, of health as a percentage game, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, you know, we live in a real world and uh, what percentage of what you do that's good and what you do that's bad is, is in your life. And if it was a 50-50 split, I've always thought, gee, that's really not good enough. 60-40, mm, I kind of go for 80-20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to do... I think that's my reality, um, which I suppose is pretty good. I'd like to do better than that. Uh, I'm just, so, you know, like I, I sort of wonder because I'm really into this stuff. I love self-experimentation. I like to go quite hard at the hard end of doing it. Um, and I still struggle to live in this pathological world and, and, you know, keep on it all the time. And that's right, you know, one in five things I'm off, really, I miss altogether. So, you know, just don't beat yourself up around that. It's like you, well, I, 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 yeah. 
I kind of, when I'm really on fire, I'm 90, 10, you know, and, yeah. and there've been various points in my life where I've, I'm a bit of an obsessive character where I've gone a hundred, a hundred percent and I'm, a, and I'm like a social outcast. No one wants yeah, yeah. to be with me or near me. Yeah. Um, which was another interesting one, you know, about this pandemic and the impact of social isolation. I, I actually read a report from the Australian, from the American Psychology Society, which said that social isolation was had negative impact on health equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not surprised about that. I, mean, I think it depends. Yeah, for me, I mean, these social isolations have been great. I've got a nice house. I've got a good family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a selection of bicycles, you know, mountain bikes, gravel bikes, stationary bikes, road bikes. Got the kids there. I just had a grand old time, frankly. Uh, <laughs> me too, me too. I but, hate to say it, but not but, everybody enjoys no, it. No, not at all. I mean, it's just a position of privilege that I'm in, and Absolutely. it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of people that I know that are, were crowded. You know, it's, I, if my kids were three, four, and five years old, you know, they hmm. can't imagine. So, yeah, yeah so I, I've had it easy. Lots of other people had it much harder. And, and, again, we just didn't discuss the costs and benefits, and it, it wasn't a topic, so I don't know. Hmm. Grant, always I enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really, no, really no, always okay, good to okay. catch up. Yeah, I could go on all day, Ron, as you know. We both could. I think we're wrong. <laughs> well, you know, I always, and this is such a treat for me to hear from somebody who's a professor of public health, you know, because I'd love to, why aren't professors of public health, health ministers and leading health departments and all of this? Well, we in this country we have them doing that, but the, the, not on. They don't think the way I think, so I don't know. Did you, uh, by the way, did you read that article? There was an article recently in the BMJ, British Medical Journal, the illusion of evidence-based medicine. Did you? Did you yeah, happen? To- yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was a really important step forward. Uh, like I've shared that with all my students. I've been sharing it around the place. I, I agree with that. Yeah, you know, we've got to the point in medicine where we've actually lost. We've lost it, and the pandemic brought that out. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how to change that though. So if anyone's got any ideas, can you like, get yourself elected or something? Yeah, yeah, because it introduced me to or reintroduced me to two terms that I think we should all be familiar with um, because they are seem to be running our health departments, and they are key opinion leaders or KOLs in marketing mm. parlance and uh, product champions. Because I, I just attended a, a two-hour seminar, a forum, public forum in Australia for treatment for COVID, yeah. and, and it was a two-hour commercial by our leaders, Brendan Murphy, Michael mm. Kidd, Paul Kelly, John Skerritt, head of the TGA. It was a two-hour commercial for four patented drugs. Astonishing, isn't it? Amazing. Amazing. I, I, I realised when I lost the plot when I was, I would listen to the BMJ podcast, and the BMJ does a pretty good job. Mm. Except for, this was a while back, and there were t- the two new uh, treatment drugs had just finished. Well, they, had, they hadn't even finished the uh, initial trial, and the the UK, the Australian, and the New Zealand government had, had already pre-ordered these things for billions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like you have no idea if it's ever going to work, let alone be uh, benef- you know, know the harms. And you know, Australia's up there. Yep. Well, there's some of that. Thanks. How much? Well, whatever you want. Yep. Well, you'd be you'd be interested to know that when I was president of ACNEM, um, uh, Ian Brighthope was writing letters to everybody yep. about uh, in government about just let's minimise harm and use vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C mm. for aged care. These are yeah. people that that just would benefit. And we got letters back from the TGA who put in those billions of dollars worth of. Uh, orders on these new experimental drugs saying insufficient evidence to uh, to even consider that. Thank you for your emails, but <laughs> I'm being, I mean, I'm being really serious, Grant, and this is, this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is just a business model. Yeah, and, and it's doing harm as well as potentially some good somewhere. I don't know exactly where, yeah, but yeah. maybe it is somewhere. So we need to, that, that is an open discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we could have one, that would be great. Grant, thank you again. It's always terrific to talk. Well, as I say, I don't know why professors of public health like Grant who uh, are into sleeping well and exercising in a sustainable and varied way 
and eating a natural, whole food, low carb, healthy fat diet, which incorporates occasional fasting into your life, which is part of our entire human journey. Um, and kind of Grant's approach to public health is so disengaged from industry that it makes it a unique approach to public health. Yes, a unique one. Unfortunately, if you haven't already got this message, uh, you, and if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you definitely will have had this message, that so many of our so-called health experts, and I always preface that now, that word with so-called health experts and, and uh, leaders in our health world in Australia, certainly that would include medical officers, chief medical officers, both federal and state governments, heads of uh, health departments in Australia, um, heads of the TGA, which is the Therapeutic Goods Association, the Australian equivalent, if you like, to the Food and Drug Administration, uh, heads of the NHMRC in Australia, the National Health and Medical Research Council, which is the, well, a sort of a smaller version of National Institute of Health in America. When you look at these organisations, I think, you know, the science in medicine, as we now know, is largely funded by the drug companies. And this era uh, of, well, certainly one could argue the last 30 or 40 years, but particularly the last two years, I describe as nirvana for big pharma. And uh, when big pharma pays for the science in medicine, what we would hope we would have are scrutineers of the science in medicine. We don't. We have groups which actually, without any hint of irony, call themselves the Friends of Science in Medicine, I wish they would change their name to the Scrutineers of the Science in Medicine, but they find we find that they are in very senior positions making public health policy. And ignorance, as I've also, is a subject that I've, um, I've touched on in this podcast several times. I've often happily admitted that um, I practice ignorance regularly. It's why I do this podcast, because I get to talk to people who know far more than I do um, on subjects which I ask them questions and they answer them. And my ignorance is, is lessened because of that interaction. And I hope yours is too. Ignorance is a wonderful driver for learning new things. But when ignorance is combined with ego, arrogance and hubris, and particularly when that ego, arrogance and uh, hubris informs public health policy, we have some serious problems as we have witnessed uh, not just in the last 30 or 40 years with the epidemic of preventable chronic diseases. So you would hope that if evidence counts for anything, um, the evidence of the increase in chronic preventable diseases is a testament to public health officials. Uh, and, uh, and when we look at also the science in medicine and we realise the illusion of evidence-based medicine, which is a topic I've covered many times, and we also realise um, how many people have unwittingly, maybe you're such a person, maybe friends or family of yourself, are, you know people like this, but many people have unwittingly become marketing and compliance officers for an industry the pharmaceutical industry, which has repeatedly been found guilty of illegal marketing and fraud and has literally cost tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of lives. It surprises me how many in the public have unwittingly become marketing and compliance officers, volunteering, free, uh, for Big Pharma. Yep, it's, it's happening out there. I think we all need to take a step back and reflect on what is important in life, which is exactly what this podcast is about. This podcast is about empowering you to take control of your health and be the best you can be. I hope it's making a contribution to that effect. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.